you know, if you use this analogy, the industrial flowers like the Ford F-150 truck, just good, solid, reliable, good stuff. On the other end, you have Tesla. And at the time we thought of this, the Tesla average price was $90,000. Yeah. A cool car, all electric, state of the art. But you know, not a lot of people can afford the Tesla. When I buy white flour, I expect that it's going to perform the same way. I don't even have to expect that I'll ever have to call anybody about it. Oh, I like how you extend the metaphor because on the Tesla, I always wonder when you run out of electricity in the middle of the trip, what do you do? Yeah. You, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to finish the trip. And so these, so, so we then realized, and let me ask you, if on the one end you have the Toyota Camry or a Ford 150, on the other hand you have the Tesla, what's in the middle? I know the answer because we've talked about this before. It's the Prius, right? And it's a hybrid. Yeah. And based on uh, bakers like you that embrace the concept, we actually do a blend with some gas-powered flour, so to speak, with some industrial flour, although the best of the best of the best, and with our artisan grains. And we get that blend perfect so that every time you bake with it, well, is it consistent? It's very consistent. It's, I remember when, uh, I think it was Emma and, and Debbie actually came and yeah. visited us and we were buying, uh, we were buying all the different grains, and we were blending them ourselves. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, but always a strong base of of white bread flour. Because what you're saying about, you know, almost in a philosophical or macro level to uh, the human population, politics, farming, agriculture, actually that same principle applies completely scientifically in bread making, and just about every a uh, sourdough baker around the world tends to agree that you need a strong foundation of structure in the loaf, and that's the white flour, whereas the, the other balance uh, is the nuance and flavor, the nutritional profiles, and, and the local representation of, of wheat from your area milled on stone. The thing we found is that we can push those limits more than people expect. A lot of people only go 20% uh, Tesla and 80% 80 uh, 80 industrial Ford F-150, but we've been able to get all the way to 50-50 yeah. uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. So today when we're milling, I noticed that the mill you guys have has that peeler in the... Yes. Did the Osteo Roller have that kind of thing? No. I think we're one of the few mills, small scale mills, that actually does that peeling. I, I have a crazy theory about that. You know, the outer coating, there's seven layers to what we call the bran layer of the grain. Mm. And the very outer layer is actually, as a, it's a poisonous protective coating for the grain so that it will survive um, insects, you know, whatever could attack it. And um, some people feel that that outer layer is not healthy for people. Have you ever done any research to know whether it's that outer layer that contains some of the anti-nutrients like phytates and yeah, lectins? Yeah, that's in the outer layer and it also creates a little bitterness. So a lot of whole grain products on the, in the, on the supermarket shelves, you'll see that they've been, um, they'll have something with them. So, so it's honey nut mm. Cheerios, whole wheat, but they add the sweetener to offset the bitterness of the outer husk. Would you say the peeler is one of the big points of differentiation right now with what you do versus what you did before? So we believe in traditional methods. So we, we stone mill, we stone mill at a slow speed so it's done uh, without introducing high temperature. All, all those things are traditional and they preserve the integrity of the grain and the flavor of the grain. Uh, but as you saw, it's automated from when the grains filled into the system to when it's uh, sifted or yeah. processed and comes out the other end. With the old mill, everything was done by hand. The mm. hoppers loaded by hand. You know, you have to manually sift it. Yeah, and so, so that's one reason why the product from that was so expensive. You had to amortize that labor into very low production. 
now uh, you met Diego. Diego can run that thing from beginning to end. Yeah. So we quadruple our output with the same amount of labor. And that's when we started becoming competitive so that we could offer that bag of flour to you for a, com a price that was competitive to the other artisan companies or smaller scale uh, mills. And, and, and we became... It strikes me that probably everyone in your chain is actually, there's no one's getting taken advantage of before I get the flour, right? The farmer, it, the farmer is happy to grow wheat for you. Farmers here in Arizona that grow cotton or they were growing even alfalfa, um, they expected a really high return per acre. But wheat, especially commodity wheat, and I, and I challenge you to go out there and look at it, they were actually losing money per acre. Wow. Growing it or making 25 to $50 per acre. Now they might have a thousand acres, so $50,000 would be their uh, profit from that. But once you took in all the cost and amortized your machinery and the repairs and you know, really looked at it, uh, there wasn't a lot of money. So we pay um, five to six times what a commodity wheat would be sold for. Uh, but the yield is less. The yield is one third. The inputs are less, so there's less money that the farmer has to put into it. Um, but it, it's not something like, as I said earlier, the farmer said if he can make a nickel and everybody in the supply chain makes a nickel, then it, it's fair. There's just not a lot of money in growing grain. Right. You talked about getting to the radical center with with consumption, really, but. How do we continue to move forward in, yeah. in a way? Well, one way we get there is that as a baker, you took the risk. What, what is a, your standard loaf cost? So we typically, for a two pound loaf, about seven, eight dollars, depending on the loaf. And, and so just like Starbucks coffee convinced people to spend three, four, five dollars for a cup of coffee, because they like it, it tastes good to, to the people. You, you've convinced them to spend about twice as much as yep. what a comparable size industrial loaf would be at the store. For sure. and, and it may cost twice as much, but I get a hundred times more enjoyment and pleasure from eating your loaf. Yeah, and yeah. You, you get to know me and we have a relationship. It, when, when you need something you can, or you have a complaint or, or a concern, you wanna see something happening, I'll listen to you, I'll talk <sighs> to you. And vice versa, when we had a crazy situation where we're outgrowing our garage and starting to push on the doors of the city as far as getting on their radar of what's going on, our community really was the difference in helping us get to the point of working with the city for our future instead of against. So there, it's not just dollars. It, people, people always like, look at food and say, oh, well, it's too expensive, but you're not just really buying the food, you're getting in, in this community. It's completely different. I don't really get a lot of groceries anymore from, from the store because I'd much rather buy from people I know, uh, check in with them, how they're doing, uh, and, and know a little bit more about what they're doing with the food that I'm eating. There's so many great produce farmers here in Arizona and, um, just like I've had your bread, it tastes so good. Um, I've had some, it's, it's, it's funny because in the stores now, some stores will say, lettuce grown in dirt. <laughs> like, like, wait, wait, where yeah. else would lettuce grow? But it's growing in a hydroponic yeah, laboratory. Yeah, water, just water. And so uh, you, you taste it and you go, there's something wrong with this. It tastes so good, you know, what do they do? But it's just, that's how it's supposed to taste when it brings the nutrients up from the soil. Um, so, but I want to go back to, to the qu question you asked about supporting this movement. When we did the, what we learned from Gary Navhan is if we meet in the radical center, we're going to actually grow our movement faster than if we stay in, in our two camps. Um, and that's because if, Okay, 
if I can meet your needs and deliver you a consistent flower that's blended with red fife, white sonora, bluebeard durum, all these heritage grains that we go, grow, rouge bordeaux that's coming up, um, then farmers will plant it. But, but if that was 100% what we sold to you in a finished form, that loaf that you sell would be 15 to 20 dollars not many people would buy it therefore we can't grow the movement it'd also be a brick it would it would, it would be, be a, a dense brick, brick. there's got to be some lightness to it and people have come to expect uh, there are good things that have happened to bread over the last hundred years in industrialization as far as texture and really what we're doing is merging the best of the old and the best of the new i think if we go back to ancient times that bread would have been very dense you would have needed um, something to dip it in or you know it would have been hard to to just eat you, like we you now. wouldn't have just been breaking pieces and eating it so it's interesting because in some ways we're sort of training all parts of the supply chain to allow a little bit more for their fellow human that that preceded them we're paying more for flour but that allows you guys to have somebody like Diego and yourselves working on the stone mill. One interesting topic that I learned, I brought this up with Diego. I once was at a lecture where this baker was saying that a hundred years ago, there was around 2,500 stone mills around the country. Uh, 25,000. Whoa, that was way more, yeah. tenfold more than I thought. Mm -hmm. Every, every community, yeah, and they had fresh flour then. And people had a relationship with their miller. Mm -hmm. So I would have, it wouldn't have just been me knowing Diego. In other words, my customers likely would have known, known who the miller around town was, right? Uh, that's completely gone now. It, you, you don't know who your miller is when you buy flour to the point that you don't even, I don't think people really distinguish between one white flour brand and another white flour brand, should they? or is all that flour kind of coming from one giant pot of, of wheat? There's a, a study that happens with, with all the crops in the central part of the United States, the wheat growing part of the country. And they go out and they sample all this wheat. And then, and then from that, they can kind of calculate how they're going to blend it to create a consistent flour. So consistency is the most important thing in the industrial process because it's all automated, it's all machines and you, you want that thing to come out the same every time. But at some point, isn't it important to convey to our fellow humans that if they don't pay a fair price for food, then we can't expect that other humans can even make the food that we consume or grow the food we consume. So the less we pay, the more likely we're only left with the giant players that can afford to lose money for a thousand acres a week because they have something else that is making them money over here. Is that, is that a fair assessment that if we don't, as a society, uh, increase the amount of value that we put into food quality, then we will see more and more small scale agriculture disappear. I was just talking about this today. I've worked in high tech and I've had, um, a lot of successes in my career, but basically I've, I'm a humble farm boy from North Dakota. I, I really don't know much. Although farm boys in North Dakota have to know a lot to farm now, so no insult to them. But um, I don't think people care about the farmer. You used to see a lot of advertising where the farmer would be in their field and they were trying to sell direct, you know, it's the, they, they would pitch, it's a family farm and their family's in the field and it's growing on their farm and you have this whole traceability thing. I don't think, I think it's a very small amount of consumers that care at all about that. There's so much nuance in flavor when people can grow different varieties of things. But when we get into these macro, I'm not saying industrial food shouldn't exist because there's a lot of people to feed, there's a lot of efficiencies to be had, and there's got to be a place for that type of food production in this world. But I guess I worry that we're not protecting 
the small farmers that are growing some different varietal of this or that that has this incredible taste where sure. you can go to Phoenix and you can start eating in Phoenix and get flavor that you don't really get when you go. See, everybody's constantly, we, we talk about this uh, as a bakery, everybody's saying, oh, I have sourdough in San Francisco or, oh, I have sourdough in France. And I, I really most of the time want to say, well, awesome. But now you're here in Arizona. I'm going to give you sourdough that's really unique to this place. Mm -hmm. And it starts with all of this story because isn't it true also when it comes to milling that your mill probably is not quite the same as any other mill around? They're all very customized, aren't they? Standardization then came over time, came with the induction an introduction of roller mills. And um, by probably the 1920s or 30s, a lot of these little mills disappeared. Everything was consolidated into big mills. A lot of it uh, centered in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And you got a homogenous, consistent uh, product. And all that, that variation in craft would have been lost, but you got this great economy of scale. I, I do want to go back to, to the whole thing about, about supporting the farmer, because I, I actually agree with you, but I take a different um, take on it. Um, so we, we crossed paths with someone who worked for a national company, and they did a campaign with their grain-based product that actually traced the uh, grain back to the farmer and also the back panel of the product was about the soil the soil's the most important thing. right you don't have soil you don't have food you don't have life when we're doing a terrible job with the soil um, the 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 wheats that we grow are really good for the soil that's why i don't mind making prius wheat or hybrid you know not not hybrid wheat but blended wheat because the more production I can move into the deep-rooted plants, the more carbon will be sequestered. The uh, better it will be for the ability of the soil to hold moisture, um, and and the more nutrients that will be passed down into the soil and be fed in the soil. That that's that's life. And the early farming practices were very very much like that. People religiously cared about the soil. They did crop rotation. They did. Uh, natural fertilizer from their uh, uh, barnyards. They, they knew that they had to uh, preserve the soil, uh, nourish the soil in order to get a crop from it and to live. When the modern agriculture came along, the soil was just the thing that held the roots. It was the substrate and, and the, you didn't really care about it. Uh, eventually then the soil gets depleted and you have to keep adding more nutrients, and you have to, um, you, you just, the, the, new, the stuff you have to add costs more than what the crop is worth. I mean, you have this huge dilemma, especially with corn and with soybeans. It strikes me that if we're paying that fair price for flour and getting a higher quality flour that that the farmer wants to bring it into their rotation, and then they're caring about the land, and perhaps there will be enough time then for the farmer to be able to start strategically making sure to care better on the soil. So we have this positive feedback cycle. And when you can get back to craft, then we can get back to innovation, Absolutely. in my opinion. Yep. I can't tell you enough how much I thank you for this time today. This is the stuff that I'm most passionate about, too. Yeah. I love baking, I love making incredible products, I love the craft. At the end of the day, I'm very much a big picture person though, so I'm hoping that the little bit of work that I'm doing is making some difference on a macro level in the world that's positive. And it strikes me that if I buy the wrong flour, I could be doing the opposite of that, even if I'm producing great bread with it. There's some things that, that we can do, that you, you take your bakers, I take the small scale millers, and we can actually change the world and feed the world. Because it's these older grains that actually thrive in arid climates, that thrive uh, when, when the diseases come and impact these other crops. But there's uh, more to talk about, and that's why the future will be interesting, because 
there is a lot of nuance and a lot of information out there, a lot of differences between mills, a lot of pseudo information, I'm sure. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that the whole conversation we had is clarifying for some as well. And, and it'll be interesting to see what we do uh, down the line.